Hi, my name is Milo Melodies, and I'm here today at Gear for Music to talk about my most favourite of subjects, and that is synthesizers. The history of synthesizers is storied and curious, and learning about the history of synthesizers also has a double benefit. By learning about the different ways that synthesizers develop, they can teach us about different ways to approach modern synthesizers. So it's really valuable to do, and it's just an interesting history lesson. This is the first in a whole series of videos, and in upcoming episodes, we'll talk about specific models of synthesizer. We'll actually show you all the different types that you could get, and we'll learn to program synthesizers too, starting with subtractive synths. So subscribe if you'd like more synth goodness. But there's quite a lot to get through, so let's begin. So firstly, other than being a source of complete and total financial ruin, what is a synthesizer and why do you need one? Like you have to ask. So a synthesizer is an electronic musical instrument. It synthesizes sound. And so a synthesizer is one of the most chameleonic, flexible instruments that you can have in a studio. Second only, of course, to a sampler, but a synthesizer can make sound all by itself. And the whole idea is that just you and your synthesizer in a studio can layer up all the parts to make a complete recording just by yourself. So they're an amazingly liberating tool because there's nothing between you and the music you want to make. You may also want to use a synthesizer, not just by itself, but as a kind of spice, as part of a recording. So you can use a synthesizer to create elements that reinforce or complement other instruments. And that could be creating extra bass in bass drums using low sub bass on your synthesizer, or little bits of white noise, or even running your voice through a synthesizer to augment and adapt acoustic instruments you know, a band performance. And of course, you can use synthesizers live on stage as well as, as in the studio. Synthesizers can be huge and massive. They can be big telephone exchange-like objects. They can be very small and portable. They can be software as well as hardware, and they can even live on your phone. But the other interesting thing with synthesizers is they can both do exactly what you tell them to, or they can give you inspiration when you don't actually know what you want. So this word synthesizer implies that synthesizers create synthetic versions of things. And that's sort of true. There is of course a huge need for keyboards that sound like real things, for people playing in bands, playing the sounds of a piano or a Rhodes piano or a violins and strings is hugely valuable. But at the end of the day, while a synth can do a pretty convincing impression of an acoustic instrument, and they've obviously gotten a lot better as time has passed. It's still hard to do, and it's still a lot easier just to hire an actual musician to play something and let a synth be a synth. You might think that this is a modern realization, but it's not. People were realizing that synths can and maybe should just be synths right from the moment that they were being pioneered. The early to mid-20th century saw pioneering inventions that led to what we know as modern synthesizers. But before the mid-1960s, the term synthesizer really only applied to one thing, and it was a thing called the RCA Mark II synthesizer. This was a very large, very expensive machine at Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center in New York. It was a fantastic machine, hugely powerful. It was polyphonic, but it was programmed using punch cards in a slightly abstract way, and that led to very abstract music being created with it. It was very powerful, but it was very exclusive. You could hardly get one in your own home or have access to it. And the other key point with it is that it could not be programmed in real time. Now, there were some electronic music instruments that could be played in real time, but they were a lot more limited. Probably the most famous of all is the theremin.
Invented in 1928 by Russian Lev Terman, the theremin is an unusual electronic musical instrument. Unusual in the sense that you don't actually touch it to produce sound. The way that it works is by moving your hand in an electrical field. By moving your left hand, you create volume swells. And by moving your right hand further to and closer to an antenna, you control the pitch. And by doing these two things in combination, you can control pitch and volume. The theremin played well can sound beautiful like a violin, but it is a difficult instrument to master. And of course, if you're used to playing a keyboard with black and white keys, it's a very unusual system to have to master. So we kind of needed something a bit more developed. Six years after the invention of the theremin in a New York hospital was born a small boy called Bob Moog. Now, Robert Moog, his mother was a piano teacher and his father was an electrical engineer for Con Edison. And that unique combination led to a boy that was interested to some degree in music, but especially in electronics and engineering. Bob built lots of hobbyist kits and was interested in taking apart radios with his father and assembling organs and especially, as time moved on, theremins. And at the tender age of 19, Robert Bob Moog created his first company, R.A. Moog Co., selling theremins and theremin kits in 1954. While conducting theremin demonstrations in November 1963, Bob was approached by a jazz musician called Herbert Deutsch. And Herb had owned a theremin that he'd actually built from one of Bob's kits. And Bob and Herb hit it off immediately. And they began to talk excitedly about concepts for synthesizers. In Herb's words, the idea that they were trying to arrive at was having synthesis at your hands. It's the idea that in your own home, you could have a synthesizer. And together, the two started to form ideas about how they could shape and control sound. Bob and Herb struck upon a whole series of designs for discrete modules, each responsible for different aspects of creating, filtering, and shaping sound. Harnessing this concept of voltage control, they developed a system of modules that took bright, buzzy sounds created by oscillators, filtered them through filters with a very lovely resonance control, and then articulated both the volume and filters and other parameters with modulators like envelopes. This method, which we just saw there, is called subtractive synthesis. So-called because we are literally subtracting sound through filters from bright, buzzy oscillators. And this is how most analog synthesizers tend to work. What was key with the Moog Modular is whilst it was very expensive, it did allow musicians for the first time to have access to powerful synthesizers, electronic sounds, but most importantly of all, which could be articulated in complex ways in real time. The Moog Modular was released in 1964. And in 1968, Wendy Carlos released Switched On Bark. This is an absolutely essential and seminal and important record in the history of synthesizers. And with Switched On Bark, Wendy recorded a Moog modular creating complete orchestrations of Bach's music. She did this bit by bit, track by track, one note at a time, using a Moog modular and a multi-track tape recorder. And this record was an absolute sensation. When it came out, it hit number 10 on the Billboard charts in the USA, and it became one of the best-selling classical records of all time, selling over a million copies, and then spawning an absolute army of copycat records. The Moog Modular was adopted by library musicians, by universities, and also by rock stars, with Moog Modulars being used on records by The Doors, The Beatles' Abbey Road used as a Moog Modular, but probably most famously of all, it was wielded on stage by Keith Emerson. The synthesizer was here, but Moog wasn't the only game in town. 
At the same time that Moog over on the East Coast was inventing the voltage-controlled synthesizer, over on the West Coast in California, a man named Don Buchler was inventing the exact same thing. The difference was that where Moog was putting a keyboard on his instrument, Don Buchler didn't. He wanted to move away from what we understood as the equally tempered clavier. Buchler's voltage-controlled synthesizers were designed to take you to new sonic worlds in every possible sense. They didn't have a traditional keyboard, and they worked in a fundamentally different way, even though they used voltage control. Whereas on the Moog synthesizer, you would start with bright oscillations and you would filter them with filters. On the Buchla synthesizer, it worked the opposite way. You would start with very simple, pure sounds and fold and mold them into more complex ones without using filters. The year before Switched On Bark came out, a composer called Morton Sabotnik was hired by a classical label to compose an electronic music album, and he used a Buchla 100 to do it. Silver Apples of the Moon is a landmark, and it's a challenging record by anyone's standard, but that was kind of the point. The Buchla was a new way of making music, and Sabotnik wanted to be led by it into new sonic worlds. Of course, abstract electronic music was not a new concept. We know that the RCA Mark II had been used to make electronic music. But even before that, music concrete made in the 40s and 50s was deeply electronic, but it used magnetic tape, small slices of magnetic tape, with real recordings being collaged together, reversed, affected and changed, and made into a piece of music, but it relied on tape and it relied on real recordings of things. In the UK, one of the most famous sort of music concrete creators was the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, who, founded by Daphne Oram, created all manner of incredible soundtracks using this magnetic tape method. Composers like Delia Derbyshire would create the soundtrack to Doctor Who by taking small pieces of recordings and assembling them together. Now, the work kind of synthesizers used in this sort of field, but they often tended to take the form of old lab equipment. That is, oscillators, filter banks, things that weren't designed for making music, but that could be interconnected kind of like modules, but critically, which couldn't really be programmed using voltages. They had to be used to make small pieces of sound, which the operator would then assemble together. They weren't like the Buchler instruments or the Moog instruments that were being created in the 60s. So it's the 1960s and modular synthesizers are here, but they're very expensive and they are still quite complex to use. In 1971, Moog released a synthesizer called the Mini Moog, which caused a complete sensation and a sea change in synthesizers. It will be fair to say that the Mini Moog is possibly one of the most important synthesizers ever released. It was conceived because an engineer called Bill Hemsath noticed that when people were encountering the Moog module for the first time, there was a kind of patch that they would put together. They would very often start with oscillators, put them into a mixer and then into a filter, and they would affect that filter and the according VCA that controlled its volume with envelope generators. And so Hemsath took bits and bobs of Moog modular synths literally lying around the workshop, and he assembled a thing that he called the Model A. And the Model A used Moog modular parts, but had the connections permanently soldered. Interestingly, Bob Moog did not approve of this idea, but Hemsath continued with it anyway. And through various prototypes, eventually led to a thing called the Model D, which was actually the only one to be released. And the Mini Moog Model D was released. And of course, history, as we now know, uh, has proven that it was the right thing to do. And it's a sensational design. And what's so powerful about the Mini Moog is that it truly is accessible to all musicians. There are relatively few controls. And while it is still somewhat esoteric, if you've never used synthesizers before, it doesn't take long to get a good sound on it. 
And that's the most important thing. In fact, the Mini Moog was so successful that it really did become the template of what synthesizers became. And there are machines that come out even today that really owe their heritage, their look, and their structure to the Mini Moog. You can see oscillators leading into mixers, into filters, with envelopes and an LFO in so many other designs. But particularly other things, like the pitch bend wheel, did not exist before 1971. That was created for the Mini Moog, and you still see it and synthesizers to this day. The Minimo proved that so often less is more. By distilling down the elements of the Moog Modular to just the barest, simplest parts, they made something that was more successful than those grand, expensive machines. Now, up to this point, synthesizers had been largely monophonic. That is to say that they could only play one note at once. Now, while we had string synths, which are like simplified forms of synthesizers, really it's only in the late 70s where we see true polyphonic synthesizers starting to emerge, beginning with giants like the GX1 and then the CS80, but perhaps most famously with the Sequential Circuits Prophet 5, which was the first synthesizer that was truly polyphonic, but also had patch memory. In the years that followed, polysynths became more and more affordable. We had the Juno 6 and the polysynth. And from Dusseldorf to Detroit, any musician who wanted access to a synthesizer, to the large part, could get hold of one. Synths were here, and they were here to stay. But very soon, the comfortable world of analog synthesizers was about to be turned on its head with a new synth made by Yamaha called the DX7. Now, the DX7 was a digital synthesizer, and it was capable of quite astonishingly realistic approximations of acoustic instruments. You may laugh now to hear what was considered realistic, but if you compare it to what analog synthesizers were capable of, and consider the fact that it was 16-note polyphonic and with patch memory, it's not hard to see why people were throwing out their analog synths. And it's weird to see the way that analog synths change. Post-1983, you'll see analog synths with all of the dials and knobs taken off that look more digital, more like the DX7. This is a bit of an issue, really, because we've come to realize that the knobs and dials, the sort of immediate tactile interactivity of analog synthesizers is half of what makes them appealing. The DX7 didn't have knobs. It had a single slider, an FM synthesizer synthesis in and of itself is very different to analog synthesis. Although we can create frequency modulation, which is what FM stands for, using analog synthesizers, it's in a more complex and structured way in the DX7, and there's only a two-line LCD to edit it with. It's quite an abstract way to make sound if you're used to the way analog synths, and a great many musicians, it would be fair to say, tended not to program their DX sevens. And I think that it's a story of law that when DX sevens would come in to get repaired at Yamaha, people would note that none of the sounds had been edited and that only the third party sounds had been left in. The thing though I've discovered personally is that programming FM synths can be hugely gratifying and interesting. It's just a completely different world. Interestingly, it's actually more like the world of Buchla when you consider the way that the sounds are structured. You start with simple sine waves and you make them more complex by folding them on top of each other. But FM synthesizers can just be a source of wonderfully strange pads and basses. And actually, despite the label of cold that gets a to digital synths. On the other hand, I actually find the original DX7 certainly to be very warm and sort of fuzzy and interesting, which is to say that all synths have their value. It's just a question of understanding what makes them great. Of course, there's loads and loads more to the story of synthesizers that we can't cover today. There's a whole litany of legends that were released in the 20th century and that really defined the course of music technology. But I want to end this video by talking a little bit about the computer revolution, because I think that was kind of the next biggest thing. And in the late 90s and certainly the early noughties, we found that our computers were powerful enough to host virtual analog synths and digital synths, and really our entire studio in the box. 
This was a very intoxicating thing. It's incredibly exciting to suddenly have all of the limitations of hardware stripped away. But it's fair to say that as years have passed, people have come to return to a more hardware way of making sound. And we can think of the computer as a kind of ultimate tape machine and do what Wendy Carlos was doing when she made Switched On Bark, but just times a million. We have all the editing power and capability of a computer at our disposal, and we can still use real analog or real digital or virtual analog or virtual digital synths, whatever suits our budget and needs. It's all in how we approach it. And that's the most interesting thing about synthesizers. When you need a hammer, they can be a hammer. Not literally, because that would invalidate your warranty, but they can do exactly what you tell them to. And if you know what you want, you can get it on a synthesizer. But the opposite thing, where you aren't sure what you want, is almost more interesting to me personally. The idea that a piano player knows that they can move their hands on the keyboard and discover chance, interesting new melodic combinations. And on a synthesizer, if it has a keyboard, then you do have that ability too. But what's amazing about the synth is that you also have the ability to explore new timbral worlds as well. You can create completely new sonic worlds as well as melodic. And really, with the exception of the sampler, there's just no other instrument that gives you that level of freedom. If you have a synthesizer and a computer to record it to, you have a limitless wellspring of inspiration. The possibilities are truly endless. So that's it. In the next video, we're going to talk all about the different types of synthesizer that you can get. And I'll actually demo them for you, talk about what's good about them, what kind of sounds you can get from them. So subscribe, check that out. And if you would like to look at synthesizers, there are lots of links below. Check those out. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.